Right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Pleasant View. Thank you for being here today as we come together and worship the Lord. Just a few announcements before we get started. So our outreach in Terra Alta Park begins uh, tomorrow, tomorrow evening. Um, and uh, just a few things that just want to communicate to you. First of all, we need grapes. I was told that we need grapes. So if you can supply grapes, then that would be a great blessing. <laughs> so anyway, uh, yeah, that's the only thing that we need out of the food donations. Um, so if you, can, if you can do that, if you'd let... Uh, if you'd let Diane know that today so she can mark that off the list. I think we have enough uh, helpers in the kitchen, and we have, uh, I think, everything else that we need. So we're going to be setting up over there tomorrow morning at some point, probably 10, 11 o'clock tomorrow morning. We'll get, we'll get things set up. We're going to try to meet outdoors this year, but we're going to be set up for the inside just in case the weather doesn't permit. So uh, we, might, we might try to meet out under the biggest pavilion there um, and, and do the, the teaching segments out there. So please be praying um, for the folks there in the park that, that'll come. And um, we had a great, God gave us a great day there on Tuesday. We were able to do some ministry over there on the 4th of July. And that was good and connecting with people. And so I'm not sure how many people are, are going to show up tomorrow evening or throughout the week, but uh, if you'd be praying about that and that the gospel would be very, very clear and that people would hear it and God would open their hearts and their, their ears to hear it and believe it and trust in Him. So that's, uh, that's that announcement. So again, be praying about that this week. And uh, Pastor Mark and a group of our people are going to be at a youth camp this week. So be praying for the students that they're going to be ministering to as well. That's going to be over around Myersdale, Pennsylvania, at a camp called Camp Penile over there. And I think, what, 50 couple young people, students are going to be there. So uh, got some ministry going on this week. So thank the Lord for that. I'm going to roll the announcement track, but I'm going to pray first. I'm going to do the track, and then Pastor Mark will stand and uh, do our call to worship. Uh, so... So let me pray for us, um, for the ministry that we have going on this week, and ask the Lord to control the weather, which He does, He will. Um, so let's pray and, and just trust Him. Father, we come before You this morning and we thank You again for a, a day that You've given us, the saints of God, to come together to worship You. Lord, we want to worship You today in spirit and in truth. So we pray that you would take this time that you've given us and that through your word, the ministry of your word, and by the power of your spirit, that you would make your word come to life in us, that we would desire to obey it and in fact would obey the scriptures. Father, we pray for the ministry we have going on this week, that you would use us as your instruments. Lord, there are a lot of people in this world and people around us that need to hear the gospel, that need to believe the gospel. There are sheep that you have that haven't yet heard your voice. And Father, we pray that they would hear your voice and that you would draw them to yourself and save their souls and change their lives, transform them by the gospel by the work that they can't do on their own, a work that's already been done through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray for that at in Terra Alta this week, and we pray for that at youth camp this week. We pray that you would use that message in each of our lives to, to proclaim that to others around us, that they would hear and be transformed by the gospel, changed by the gospel. Father, just take control of us now. Take control of every person in this room. Lord, help us to be attentive to your word. Help us to worship you right now in spirit and in truth. 
Lord, as we sing and as we agree in prayer and as we listen to your word and as, as you use your word in our hearts to give us the desire to obey it and then to actually the power to obey it. Work in us today. Use this time for our good and your glory, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's roll the announcements and then Pastor Mark will come. Would you please stand with me as I read our call to worship this morning from Colossians 3. Hear this. Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you almost also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. With all this ministry, one thing we do know, um, and sometimes we falter in this, as I was admitting earlier, uh, we falter in this, but um, one thing that we are promised is our God will go before us. So would you remain standing and let us sing this as our hymn of the month, Our God Will Go Before Us. Our God will go before us and guide us by His presence. What confidence this promise is, we will never walk alone. Through unknown paths, through shadows. Stay sweet. 
every knee will bow, every tongue confess, that you alone are worthy, Lord.
You may be seated. As we move into our corporate prayer time, I want to give you the opportunity to to pray in just a minute right where you you sit. A few years back, I heard a man teach on praying, a pastor, and he used used this term, um, Scripture-fed, Spirit-led praying. And he said that when we pray, oftentimes we just have a want list or a checklist and we name all these things we'd want God to do or we want from God and that kind of thing. But he said that he's learned that when he's most blessed in praying, he lets God talk first. So he came up with this term, Scripture fed. That's God speaking, Spirit led. So I want to read a psalm right now. And I want you to listen to the words of this psalm. Listen to God's word. Listen to God speak. And take some of the the phrases and and the concepts that you hear in this. And I want us to reflect that back to him in just a minute. Just in sentences. Thanking God for something. Just the principles and the concepts. So here's the psalm. It's Psalm 96. If you want to follow along in your Bible. Psalm 96. And it says, O sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare His glory among the nations, His marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before Him. Strength and beauty are in His sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. Bring an offering and come into His courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before Him all the earth. Say among the nations, The Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for He comes, for He comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. So let's take a few minutes from that song. What would God prompt you to to lift back up to him in praise? And we'll pause and just ask you to be brief and, and to speak up so we can all agree with you in prayer. And then after this time of prayer winds down, I'll, I'll close this. So, Father, would you please now impress our hearts with how great you are. And, Lord, help us. It's, it's, it's your air in our lungs. So help us now to say back to you what's in our hearts in worship. Lead us, we pray.
Father, we could be here all day and even for several days, years, if we would really be able to recall your greatness and, and, and recall all the glorious deeds that we've even seen with our own eyes and heard with our own ears. And, and then, Lord, we would not be able, we would not be able to give you all the glory that you deserve and all the glory that you are. But here we're told in this moment from the psalmist to ascribe to you glory and strength. Ascribe to you glory that's due your name. Ascribe to you and worship you in the splendor of your holiness. We come here this morning. It's a, it's a day unlike any other day where corporately we have gathered as the church. And we are here because there's no one like you. We don't go to places like this and gather and give glory to a mere man or a worthless idol, as it says here. All the gods, the little gods of men are just worthless idols. We come here to worship a God who is sovereign, who is eternal, who is omnipotent, all-powerful, omniscient. He knows everything. And there's so many attributes that we can ascribe to you that are in your word that we hear, we read, we, we, we study, and your spirit gives understanding that overwhelms us sometimes with your greatness. Oh, Lord, we're thankful today that we pray to a God who listens. We pray to a God who is all-powerful, not restrained by anything else. So that out of your sovereign providence, you act and you work in ways that, Lord, we can't even begin to understand. Your ways and your thoughts are not like our ways and our thoughts. And that's why we're here. Blow us away, Lord, by the truth of Scripture this morning and who you are. And how you've made a way for us to know you through your son, Jesus Christ. Oh Lord, open our hearts that we might hear your word. Help us to truly worship you in spirit and in truth today, we ask. We can't do it apart from you. We can't worship you apart from you. We need you. So pour out your grace Pour out your power and your help into our lives right now that we might, we might worship you and enjoy you. We ask these things through your son, Jesus Christ, for his glory and our good. Amen. I forgot my notes. This morning we're going to be in that short little letter in the New Testament, the letter of Paul to Philemon. You go through the first and second Timothy, Titus, Philemon, and you get to Hebrews, and Philemon is, is tucked in there, just 25 verses, just one page probably in your Bible there. So uh, if you would find that, we're going to read that letter today. And we're going to spend some more time there. This summer, my attempt has been, to, has been to go through some of the little letters of the New Testament. We've gone through um, 2 John, 3 John, Jude, and now we're in Philemon. When you find that, would you stand as we read through those verses? Paul identifies himself as the author in verse 1. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. To Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Aphia, our sister, 
and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharings of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus. I appeal to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I'm sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this, perhaps, is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever. No longer a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me. But how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. And if he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than you say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I am hoping that through your prayers I will be graciously given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you your spirit. And we say together, amen. Amen. You may be seated. So last week we spent some time, I did some background. I'm not going to overlap that much. If you missed last week's sermon, you can go back and, and catch that on our, on our web page there. Um, the intention of this letter is forgiveness and reconciliation. Here's a runaway slave, a runaway bond servant, who's run away from his master, perhaps stolen from him. We don't know for sure, but it seems like Paul is making an appeal there. If he's taken anything, if he's done anything wrong, I'll pay for it. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll make amends for that. So there's a lot of speculation that maybe he ran off from Philemon, Onesimus ran off from Philemon and maybe stole some things. Paul is willing to make it right. And he wants the church to know that Onesimus is now a changed man in Christ Jesus. So receive him back, no longer as a slave, but as a brother. So the the message, the, the message is this ministry of reconciliation, this ministry of forgiveness first and then reconciliation. Paul actually gives four imperatives here to Philemon and to maybe Aphia and uh, who else is mentioned here? Archippus and even the whole church. And the imperatives are this. You see the first one in 17, verse 17, receive or welcome back Onesimus. 
I'm sending him back. If Paul indeed was in Rome under imprisonment here, under house arrest, that would have been several thousand miles from Colossae. So it's quite a journey, but he's coming back. Welcome him back. Receive him. That's verse 17. That's the first imperative. Verse 18, if he's taken anything or if he's done any wrong, charge it to my account and receive him like you would receive me if it was me coming. Give him that same sort of welcome, that same sort of, you know, acceptance. That's 18. Verse 20, refresh my heart. There's the, there's the third imperative, the command. Refresh my heart. He said earlier in the letter, you refresh others in the church. You refresh other believers. You have this ministry of refreshment. It's gotten back to me. I, I, I take great joy in it that when people get around you, they're refreshed in the Lord, not refresh me by doing the right thing here. And then 22, he says, prepare for me a room that I'm very hopeful that I'm going to get out from under this arrest and that I'm going to be rejoining you to actually see this reconciliation, see this beautiful work of forgiveness I'm going to see it with my own eyes, so prepare for me a room. I'm coming. Those are the four imperatives. We're going to break those down in a little bit different way. But uh, reconciliation, forgiveness. And while I was studying this week, I read this interesting story. In September of 2018, not, not too long ago, there was a Dallas police officer. Some of you may remember hearing this story. A woman named Amber Geiger who mistakenly entered the wrong apartment. It had been a long shift, and she was extremely tired, thinking the apartment was her own. As she entered, she saw a man sitting on the couch, still in uniform and carrying her sidearm. When the man heard her come through the door, he reacted quickly after hearing the noise, and she accidentally drew her weapon, shot, and killed him. A year later, she was convicted of murder. Something interesting happened at the trial, though. The man's brother took the stand in the trial and acknowledged that Geiger, this officer, took some, something from his family that could never be returned. And then he looked at Officer Geiger right in the eyes and explained, but I don't wish anything bad for you. My brother wouldn't want that for you either. I hope you look to God for help and ask Christ to forgive you, and He will. And then he said these powerful words to her in the courtroom, I forgive you. And then he asked the judge for permission to give Amber Geiger a hug right there in the courtroom. They both broke down in tears after permission was granted. Amber Geiger was forgiven by this man, but it didn't change her sentence. It didn't bring the man's brother back. But what it did was something very powerful. It put Christ on display. It demonstrated what can happen when a life is transformed by the gospel, by the grace of God. When we truly find forgiveness in Christ for our sins against Him, we find freedom and trust to release others of their sins against us. This brother freed himself from seething bitterness and unforgiveness. He freed Amber from any additional guilt. And now we read in Philemon 1.17 where Paul asked Philemon to receive him as you would receive me. Isn't that what Jesus asks of His Father on our behalf, that is the gospel, receive Wally as you would receive me. He doesn't hold Wally's sins against him anymore. I have the record of Christ Jesus given to me so that Christ can say, receive Wally as you receive me. Verse 18 says, and if He wronged you, at all, or owes you anything, charge that to my account. Brothers and sisters, when we forgive, it is one of the clearest displays of the gospel that a person can visually see. 
when we hold on to anger and bitterness and, and unforgiveness, it distorts the gospel, especially if it's those who, who, who claim the name of Jesus Christ. When we forgive, we reflect the gospel. When we work toward reconciliation, we act, we act on behalf of Christ. And that, that can be, as we heard in the Sunday school class this morning, that can be in a marriage, that can be in your family, or it can be towards others in the church, it can be towards coworkers. Listen, this is where the rubber meets the road, what it really means to be a believer. I mean, we can say all we want, you know, I, I, I believe the gospel, you can explain the gospel, but can you live the gospel? Is Christ really, by His Spirit, abiding in you? So the message of this little book, Philemon, is essentially a message of reconciliation, forgiveness first, we're going to talk about the difference there, and, and the word forgiveness is never even mentioned in this. The message of Philemon is a new identity in Christ. The message of Philemon is a transformed life by the gospel. It's about a reconciliation that is brought about in and through the work of Jesus. Now, the overview last week, we did the little alliteration. You know, the first section is prayer. The, the second section is the providence of God. How, how in the world did this slave meet Paul in a in a, in a, in a you know, under house arrest and and imprisonment in Rome. And Paul happens to know Philemon, his master. Providence. And then the the last section is pardon. My points last week were the gospel transforms lives. We see see it transformed Paul. We see it transformed um, Philemon. And, and, And now we're seeing it transform Onesimus. So the gospel transforms lives. It transforms, therefore, relationships. If my life is transformed by the gospel, then relationships that I'm struggling in right now are all going to be transformed as well. And then the third point was the gospel transforms our relationship with God, which is where we really want to look today. We want to look at that pardon part of this letter, and we want to look at how the gospel transforms our relationship with God. So I've got a couple of points here. Let me give them to you. The first one is reflect the gospel. That's what Paul is saying, reflect the gospel, live out the gospel. He's he's saying that to Philemon and his wife, Aphia, and Archippus, and the whole church at Colossae. Reflect, live out, reflect the gospel. Don't just get in your little room where we talk about it, but when you leave these four walls, you live out the gospel. Number two, receive the one changed by the gospel. That's the second point that we're going to look at. And we're going to take the most time with that one probably. Then number three, release debts to the account of another. Paul stood. He was such, he had a, had such a heart for reconciliation. He said, charge it to me. I'll take care of it. Don't hold it against this man. I will, I will take care of anything that he's troubled you with. Number four, refresh my heart. And number five, ready my hope. There's another alliteration there. They're all R words. When I do that, it helps me. So that's why I do it. I don't know if it's very helpful to you or not, but it helps me to remember. Like, what was that other R word that I was supposed to remember? Um, so let's go back to the first one here. And, and again, we, we covered a lot of this last week. Paul's appeal to Philemon here is to reflect the gospel. Let the church there in Colossae be a witness, a testimony of what it looks like to forgive, how Christ has forgiven you. Be a living example of the gospel work of Christ, is what he's saying. Receive this slave Onesimus back because Christ has changed him. You're getting back a new man. You're getting back a new person in Christ. That's what the gospel does, by the way, which we have seemed to forget in our culture. Again, we, we, we limit it to some repeating after me prayer or, or something like that. But no, 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 no. Listen, the gospel transforms lives. That's what it does. It changes lives. It, it, it gives you a whole new way of thinking. You don't think like the culture. And, and that's a process. But that's what it does. So this Onesimus, 
left a rebellious runaway slave. Now he's returning, Paul says, as a beloved brother. You're getting back a new man. So that's the first point. Reflect the gospel, Philemon. Reflect the gospel, Aphia. Reflect the gospel, Archippus. Reflect the gospel, church at Colossae. Do you see how he, he starts with the most personal one involved, but it, how it affects the whole church? Like, like your bitterness towards somebody in this church you think is just some private matter, but it's affecting the whole church. Paul writes this letter to Philemon first, but he's going down to the whole church so that they can hold Philemon accountable in this. The effort of forgiveness and pursuit of reconciliation is a vivid, powerful display of gospel power. And by the way, it's our ministry. If you were to read 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 21, I think we're going to have that on the screen up here. But this is, this is what Jesus Christ calls you to when you get saved, a ministry of reconciliation, bringing other people to, to the gospel, but also just modeling the gospel in our relationships. Look at 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 21. For the love of Christ controls us, talking to believers here, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore we all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for, the sake, for their sake died and was raised. Wow. Wow. I want to commentate so bad, but we're going to move on because I need to get through this. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Look at this next phrase. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, we quote this verse, don't we? But we don't read the ones around it. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's transformed, he's a new creation. It's not just some mental ascent that's happened here. He's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And all this, all this transformation is from God. We don't do it ourselves. Who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Your whole life as a believer is to try to to take lost people and reconcile them with the Holy God through the preaching of the gospel. That's what he's saying first. But it also, I think, includes here reconciling people to people who claim to have the gospel because it's it's, it's really an oxymoron. (laughs) If you say you have the gospel and you're not willing, you're not trying, you're not laboring, you're not believing and trusting for the power of reconciliation, In your life here, Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. You're an agent of reconciliation. You you, you promote forgiveness. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Do you see that reflection of the gospel in our actions to forgive, to reconcile, and even to go out And have that as our ministry to see lost people and want so badly to have them know the one that can bring them back to the the fellowship and and the relationship that they're really longing for with their creator, with their sovereign creator. And it's through the ministry and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
So that's point number one, reflect the gospel. If I could say anything to you today in this church, if you are a brother or sister in the Lord, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, if you are trusting fully in His finished work on the cross, then reflect it with your life. You're not like the world. You don't grumble. You don't complain. You don't make fun of people. You don't make all kind of political statements against the president. In a, in, a, in a derogatory way. We don't do that, even when we don't agree with his politics. We are different. We are gospel people. We reconcile. We work at reconcile, uh, reconciliation. As, it mu- as much as it has to do with us, we live peaceably with all men, as much as it has to do with us. But we also speak the truth. Reflect the gospel. The second thing here is receive the one changed by the gospel. Get that from verse 17. So if you consider me your partner, I mean, Paul's landed on the line. If you like me, if I'm your buddy, if I'm your friend, if you consider me your partner, then receive this slave just like you would if Paul was coming. If Paul's coming back to Colossae to visit that church, I want you to give him the same reception this slave Onesimus as you would me and listen if he's wronged you at all I don't know what that means a lot of commentators think that it means he took something from Philemon he stole from him if he if he if he's stolen from you whatever he's done if he owes you anything Paul is so He's so excited about displaying forgiveness and reconciliation as part of displaying the gospel that he says, I will take care of it. The main point of the letter, again, is Paul asking Philemon to forgive Onesimus. And the word forgiveness isn't here in the letter, but the word receive is, or the word welcome is. And what he's saying, by saying receive or welcome, Whatever is between you two, let it go. Let it go and receive, forgive, work towards reconciliation. When I I say receive the one changed by the gospel, I I think what, what he's saying is forgive just as Christ has forgiven you. Now, did Onesimus deserve forgiveness? I mean, he ran away. Maybe took something. I don't know. But, but the, the punishment under the law for running away was harsh. As a slave, if you ran away, it would have been harsh under Roman law. He could have been punished legally. According to the law, Philemon had no reason in the world, worldly system or culture, he had no reason to be merciful here. And that's why Paul's saying be different than the world. He left a slave, he returns a a brother. Treat him like a brother. Receive him as you would receive me. So it's about forgiving those who don't deserve it, forgiving those who should be punished, forgiving those who have wronged us severely, forgiving them completely, surrendering the bitterness, the malice, the revenge. Which begs the question, what is forgiveness? And again, we've been through this in a, in a Sunday school class, so we got a lot of great biblical instruction and help to put, it, put, put everything around it, but everyone wasn't there, so let me fill you in on some of the things. Forgiveness. Let me, let me identify maybe first what forgiveness isn't, because some of you are so hesitant. Somehow, you know, somebody's not going to get theirs, and they hurt me, and they wounded me. So what forgiveness isn't? Forgiveness is not thinking or saying or acting as though nothing wrong was done to you. A great wrong may have well been done to you. So it's not not thinking. When you look at that person, he didn't do anything wrong to me or she didn't do anything wrong to me. Second, forgiveness is not reestablishing a wonderful relationship at least right away. Like, okay, we just wipe it clean and we just, you're a hypocrite if, if you're doing that. 
because your, your feelings are not, are not caught up with your actions there. And, and it's kind of hypocritical. Forgiveness is not necessarily reestablishing, but it is working towards a relationship. It is working and pushing into that. Hopeful, really down deep in your heart, hopeful, hopeful that God is going to do something here that brings the relationship even better than it was. Romans 12, 18 says this, if possible, as far or so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Colossians 3.13 says it this way, forbear with one another and if someone has a complaint against another, forgive. Now, forbearing with one another means literally endure, work towards it, move towards it, but there's going to be some endurance. There will be frustrating Annoying, sometimes hurtful things about others that no amount of forgiveness will fix. But the Bible says we have to bear with them, trusting God. Third, forgiveness does not mean that trust is immediately restored. So many think that, and, and there's scripture for for all these. I'm just going over the points right now. So, so many think that to forgive is to restore completely the trust that was lost right away. Trust is built. To give trust to someone who has betrayed you assumes that that person has changed and does not have that same untrustworthy pattern in, in their life. So it doesn't mean that you trust and that trust is fully and immediately restored at the moment they say, will you forgive me? And you say, yes, I forgive you. Fourth, forgiveness can be real and freeing for you even if the other person does not accept your plea for forgiveness or want it. You want to forgive and they don't think they've wronged you, in other words. So they're, they're just, no, I don't. I didn't do anything wrong, so get over it. Can you imagine that? Like you humble yourself and you go to somebody and you say, you, you, you hurt me, you wounded me, but I forgive you. And, and they look at you and say, I didn't do anything wrong, so get over it. So I'm glad. I'm glad that sometimes I keep working towards it even though it's not reciprocated. And, and that's really the difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. When the other person is, is willing, when both parties are willing to come before each other and forgive one another, then reconciliation can take place. You might say, well, why does forgiveness matter? Again, forgiveness is a clear reflection of the gospel. Forgiven people forgive. Jesus said that if we don't forgive, we won't be forgiven. Matthew 6, 14 and 15. If you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive your trespass. What's that saying? It's saying that when we really grasp the forgiveness that God has given us, then what could be worse Somebody doing something to you than you have been towards God. And that's the point. That's really the point. We don't think that we've done any injustice to God. We don't think that we've done anything wrong towards a holy God that deserves our praise and our adoration and, and our thoughts and, and to live every minute of our life under the understanding that He is my sovereign creator King, Lord, He's eternal, He's omnipotent, He's, he's all these things. And, I, and, and, and a lot of people just don't think they've done anything bad towards Him. A lot of people don't get why Adam and Eve got such a harsh punishment. <laughs> That's the way they word it. We're just taking a bite of a piece of fruit. And if you want to get a, a, a real understanding about this, go, go look up R.C. Sproul and his statement on that. On, on YouTube. I, I'll bring it in and show it to you sometime. But So, 
It's a, it's a clear reflection of the gospel. Forgiveness is wanting the good, not the ruin of the one who wronged you in spite of the wrong and then acting for their good. And if your heart's not there, then ask the Lord to change your heart. Do you want good for someone that's wronged you? Do you want them to change? Do you want them to experience Jesus? Or it's like, I don't care if they ever experience Jesus. In other words, you won't let their sin make you sin. You'll lay it down and pray for their good, and you'll work for it, and you'll ask God to change your heart. You won't bring it up. Once you forgive someone, you don't bring it up again in order to keep holding it against them. Now, it may come up in a discussion as you work through things, but you don't keep holding their sin against them. That's not forgiveness. You let God deal with them. So forgiveness is this clear reflection of the gospel. And you say, well, why is that important? Because in a relationship with God, forgiveness goes both ways. God gives forgiveness and we receive it. And therefore, we forgive and others receive it. Luke 6.32 says this, If you love those who love you back, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. This is Jesus, by the way, speaking in Luke 6. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount or more. But I say to you, love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High, for He is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful even as your Father is merciful. There's... There's a tall order, isn't it? Like who of you can do that in your own strength in here? Who does not need to get on their knees and cry out to God for this kind of attitude, this kind of thinking? Forgiveness marks out gospel people. That's what he's saying there. If you understand who I am, if you are following me, if you're a gospel person, if you're changed by the gospel, then this kind of behavior will mark, you're going to stand out pretty quick in the culture that we live in. Secondly, forgiveness keeps in perspective that we were greater enemies of God than what you think your enemy is. You've been forgiven an offense against God that is millions of times greater than any human has offended or sinned against you. Some of you aren't persuaded. It cost God sending His very own Son to earth to pay the debt for your sinfulness. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. The outrage of the way Think of it this way. The outrage of the way you have treated the holy, sovereign, creator God in your sin and unbelief was so great that it cost him the death of his only son to forgive you. In other words, your debt was infinite towards God. Nobody who has wronged you has ever come close to wronging you as badly as you have wronged God. And yet he sets his love and his forgiveness on you to change you and set you free from any bondage of bitterness. What would it mean if we refuse to give, forgive? Think of it this way. It would mean that we think God is a fool to forgive us. I'm not going to be stupid and foolish and forgive someone who has wronged me and hurt me. What, you mean like God has towards you? So God must be foolish to forgive me since I'm not going to forgive. And that's pretty serious. 
Another reason we should forgive is Jesus died to forgive his enemies. Hanging on the cross to purchase our forgiveness, Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. Another reason to forgive is God promises a great blessing for those who forgive. Matthew 5, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad. Why? Because I am going to give you a reward that's going to be great in heaven. And God himself will deal with unrepentant sinners. We think if we don't punish those who hurt us or do wrong in some way, that they're going to get away with it. Here's what Romans 12, 19 through 21 says. Beloved, never avenge yourself, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So, again, let's go back to Philemon. There's plenty of reasons that we should forgive. In the Bible, God gives us the example. It's, it's, it's when we bear witness to the gospel the clearest. So, I love how Paul here says, I'm not going to make this a command. Philemon, I believe the Lord's doing a work in your life. And so I want you, by your own will, to do these things. Because we can make people. You ever done that to your kids? Tell your brother you're sorry. Sorry. Oh, great. They've forgiven one another. And everything's good. Now let's go to Disney World. You know. Has that ever happened to you? Anybody, anybody ever done that as a kid? You remember doing that? You know? And then you're plotting more evil in the background towards your brother. You know? We wonder how this happened with Cain and Abel. It's called sin. And it's crouching at all of our doors, right? And so we have to look to the Word of God and renew our minds. So I love that. I love that about how Philemon deals with that. What's the difference between forgiveness and reconciliation? One person can choose to forgive, but in order for reconciliation to take place, it takes both of you, right? And that's what we're working towards. So forgiveness begins with a choice of the will to obey God because he says forgive. Even though our feelings aren't there yet, the will says I want to obey God. I will do what God says. But it's also a spiritual act, which means that ultimately I rely on God's grace to accomplish this. Whatever I'm lacking, I believe God will supply. All the feelings that aren't there, I believe that if I take this first step and I trust in God that He will bring what I need when I need it in order to keep moving forward towards reconciliation. Reconciliation, on the other hand, is a multiple person process. When I reconcile with another person, both of us must first ask and or offer forgiveness. We're all going to face situations where it's hard to forgive. And when we're the one who's hurt, we often think that our situations are unique. Somebody will sit down to try to open God's word and counsel with you, and you'll, and you'll, and you'll push back by saying, you just don't understand what I've been through. It's, you've never been through anything like this. So don't give me this Bible stuff. Listen, there's nothing new under the sun. God's truth speaks to all these situations. We, it, what, what you're really saying when you say that is my heart is too hard right now. I'm not going to receive God's word as counsel. But we all face situations like that. And we make up hundreds of reasons why we're not going to forgive while dwelling on the wrongs on how we could get back or we'd love to see it. I mean, we're not plotting things, but we'd love to see them get theirs because they've hurt me, they've wounded me, right? 
We all feel this way. Don't be a hypocrite. We've all felt this way. I feel this way as the pastor, and I have to bring my thinking subject to the Word of God. We've all felt this way. But here's the bottom line. God forgave me all my sins while Jesus sacrificed his very life to pay for me. Jesus forgave the people who nailed him to the cross even. Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. Then we see Stephen in the book of Acts doing the same thing, saying the same phrase. They're about to stone him. They're about to kill him. They're mocking him. They're laughing at him. And these are religious leaders, many of them, zealot religious leaders standing around, ready to kill him. And he looks up to the heavens and smiles and says, Father, forgive them. They don't really understand what they're doing. Now, do you think Stephen died in slavery and bondage that he never got to see vengeance on his enemies? Or do you think Stephen died and was received into heaven with great freedom and liberation in his soul? Number three, back to the notes. Release debts to the account of another. I love the way Paul does this. It just shows his heart to see that, that people in the church are living out, reflecting the gospel and living in, in context of family towards one another here. So he says, don't only welcome Onesimus in some tolerable way when he comes back. Okay, Paul wrote this letter and we got to put up with this guy. Let him come in and everybody's over here talking and Onesimus in the church is standing over here by himself. That's not what's going on here. Don't only welcome Nesimus in one or in some tolerable way, but receive him just like you would me. And if he owes a debt, charge it to me. Have you ever stood in the gap for a relationship in, in, in such a way? Like, like two people fighting in the church, and you step in to try to be the peacemaker, the reconciler, and you're like, take it out on me. Like whatever he's done, I'll give it back to you. Let's forget him. Let's, let's say it's repaid. He's, he, he's changed. He's working it out. His, God is working in him. Receive him back. And that's what Paul does here. He's saying release his debts to the account of another. Now, again, look at the gospel being worked out in Paul's life here. What a reflection. Isn't that what Christ did for us? Release Wally's debts on my account. I will pay for his sin. I will pay for him. That's the gospel. He's reflecting Christ. It's a beautiful picture of the gospel. It's the ministry of reconciliation. It's exactly what Jesus says when he sends the sinner, as it were, back to his father. He says, Father, charge all of their indebtedness to my account. Charge it all to me. Back to 2 Corinthians 5. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, Christ God, uh, Christ in God, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And you, th and you think, how can this possibly happen? How, how may we stand before God without fear? And how may we look at him perfect as a holy God? And how may he look on us as sinners without any displeasure? The answer, Christ. Christ. The answer is that this trans transaction has taken place in Christ because in his death, God's wrath is turned away from us and our sin is canceled and imputed to Christ. Look what he says next here in verse 20. So yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. The word benefit we talked about a little bit last week. The Greek word means joy. So give me some joy. You make others joyful. You refresh them through your gospel ministry mentioned in the prayer in the first part of this. I want some joy from you. Refresh my heart in Christ by doing the right thing. So Paul offered to pay Onesimus' debt, much like Jesus did for us. Paul also reminded Philemon of the spiritual life that was given to him through his own work. So he says to Philemon, look at what God has done for you and how much 
Christ has forgiven you. Do the same for Onesimus. The word refresh is the Greek word to take ease, to give rest. Put my heart at ease. Let my heart rest that this church is going to be an example in Colossae of the gospel. This kind of response is one that the world cannot explain. Because here's the questions that we would ask. What if Philemon forgave with nothing in return? What if instead of treating Onesimus worse than before, he treated him far better like his own beloved brother? How would the world take note of that? What if Philemon's lost neighbors, shocked by his patience and forgiveness, received Christ in the light of his witness? How marvelous Jesus Christ is going to look on that day if the watchers are watching a church act like that. And Paul's confident that they're going to, you know, we don't know the end of the story. We don't know what happened. Do you know what happened? I don't. But Paul, it's as if he has such hope and he sees the hopefulness and the power of the gospel that he almost writes the end of it without it even happening by saying, get ready. Ready my hope. Ready my hope in this. I'm confident that you're going to do the right thing. I'm confident that the church at Colossae is going to, is going to shine for Jesus Christ through this episode. I know that you will do even more than what I'm asking right now. And it's going to be such a stunning testimony of of transformation in the gospel that I want you to get a room ready for me because I'll be there. I'm going to see this with my very own eyes. He doesn't know how this is going to turn out, but his hope in the Lord, in the gospel, is so powerful that he says, get the room ready. I'll be there. He's not even out of prison yet. He's, he's thousands of miles away over and under house arrest in Rome. And he says, get it ready. I'm going to be there. He's trusting that Philemon will indeed receive Onesimus back wholeheartedly, just as God in Christ Jesus forgives and receives us. He knows that the same love of God that has transformed him has also transformed Philemon, and it's also transformed now Onesimus. Christ has not only paid the penalty for their sins, but He's also given them the power through His grace and supplied by His Spirit to live out what it looks like to have this transformed life. Paul is so confident of this that he says, in effect, Philemon, ready my hope. I want to be there and see all of this with my own eyes. See changed lives, see reconciliation, see peace, see unity, see mutual servanthood working together for the gospel. And there's, also a, there's also maybe a sense in which he's saying, I thought about this. I'm going to come and I'm going to check up on you to see if you follow through with what I'm writing to you about. <laughs> Nonetheless, it's accountability. He's already confident that Philemon will step up and do what he's asking. So it's also an encouraging note to end on that Paul was no lone ranger here in this. First of all, Timothy, is a, it's implied here that he's a co-writer in this letter. That at very minimum, he was sitting beside him and, and, and he was reading the letter back to Timothy because Timothy's name is on the front end of it. It's also also very encouraging that he sends greetings from fellow workers in verse 23. He mentions Epaphras. We know Epaphras was the one who preached in Colossae at the very beginning. He mentions Mark. Boy, if that isn't redeeming. Remember him and Mark had a falling out. And they split ways. They couldn't agree on something. We don't even know what it was. And they split ways. But he mentions Mark here. So that's been reconciled. That's been forgiven. That's been worked through. He mentions Aristarchus and Demas and Luke. Here's the point. You're not a lone ranger. 
We work together as a church through these issues, through issues when people have odds against each other. We work together as a church. We don't push it aside. We shouldn't anyway. We do sometimes, but we shouldn't. This is serious stuff. It's about Pleasant View Baptist Church, and when our name goes out there, they don't even hear our name. They, they hear Jesus. They see Jesus. We exemplify Jesus, just like Paul exemplified Jesus. He was uniquely used by God, but he recognized that he was part of a team. He wasn't a lone ranger. He wasn't starstruck here. Every member of that team was important to him, and he mentions him by name. And so it is with every local church. So as we close here this morning, we kind of finish our look at Philemon here. Do you see the gospel through Paul's actions? Do you see how Paul reflects the very things that Christ did on our behalf to save us? Do you see that? Or is this just some letter? We don't know how it got stuck in here. We, you know, why are we reading other people's mail anyway? That kind of thing. Uh, as I said last week, it's a personal letter, but it's not a private letter. It was put in the Holy Scriptures so that we could read it and learn from it and grow in grace from it. So let me pray for us right now. Father, we, we have through the years been faced with people who have been in disagreement with us or we have offended We've had people within our own church offended at one another. It's going to happen. That's why we have letters in the Bible that address these things. Even though we're sanctified people, we're saved people, we're saints, these things are going to happen. The question is not, are they going to happen? It's, will we reflect the gospel when they do? Will we take on the mind of Christ who, who didn't consider it robbery to be equal with God? He was God and yet came in the form of a servant, gave, giving up many of his rights and living out what it meant to die to self, to die in the place of sinners, and to, to then be given a name, to, to be subject to the Father's will, to, to subject himself to the obedience of, of the Father, uh, willingly wanting to do this so that God exalts him and gives him a name that is above every other name the name of Jesus Christ, where one day God will put him on display in such a way that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ truly is Lord to the glory of God. Oh Lord, help us to learn how to die to self. Help us to learn how to forbear. Help us to learn how to forgive no matter what people have done against us. We've read some amazing stories here in these sermons in the last couple of weeks where people who've lost loved ones because of the evil of another and yet turn around and forgive that person and work towards reconciliation. Oh, Father, that's the gospel power that we all need working in us when people offend us. So, Lord, help us. Help this church to exemplify the gospel, what it looks like to forgive, to have this ministry of reconciliation. Use us in such ways that the light of Christ will draw men and women, boys and girls, to himself. Thank you, Lord. Show us how we need to respond right now. Many of us have maybe our own situations going on even now at the moment. We came here, and this is not what we expected to hear today. This is maybe not what we wanted to hear today. But help us 
to look at the truth of Scripture and then walk in obedience for the glory of your name and for the good of our own souls, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Would you please stand? Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior. The hope.
Let me send you with this benediction this morning from Romans chapter 15. We looked at Romans a couple times today. Uh, Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. So thank you so much. Um, may you go abounding in hope um, with the, you know, the, what Christ fills us with, what the Holy Spirit fills us with, what God has saved us. And uh, let's go in His grace. Um, keep in mind to be praying for uh, Terralta ministry this week and for um, the camp, youth camp this week, and other things that are going on in our lives, right? Amen. So reach out to each other as brothers and sisters. Know what's going on in our lives so no one, no one gets lost, right? Um, thank you for joining us today. We'll see you next time.